Good evening, everybody. So I think I think everybody's in. Um, so 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 hello and well, welcome. Um, my name's Daniel Parsons. I'm a professor in sedimentology and I'm the director of the Energy and Environment Institute um, here at the University of Hull. Um, I'm, I'm delighted you you've, you've tuned into to the webinar this evening, where we're going to tell you all about our uh, panorama doctoral training program um, and, and you'll hear from from the, the supervisors of the, the project and, and some existing students as well. Um, a little bit first of all about um, the, the university and, and the Energy and Environment Institute and the program itself. So um, uh, the, the, the Energy and Environment Institute hosts the, the Panorama DTP um, but obviously draws on the expertise of, of supervisors from right across the university in environment, uh, um, environmental science facing areas. So, so the supervisors you'll hear from um, the, this evening um, are drawn right across the university from, from, from the range of faculties and departments as well. Now, um, the, the Institute is here to really crystallize interdisciplinary uh, work, work that addresses global challenges that, that are, you know, face um, the the uh, the environment through to to energy and sustainability as well. So, so there's a real fusion of of, of expertise and capability um, brought brought through the the institute. Um, more broadly, that the the Panorama DTP is a is a collaboration um, with with uh, the universities of Hull, um, York, and and Leeds University um, as well. Um, and the the, the program is there to to really bring together all of that expertise across those those universities um, in in this space, which is which is world leading. Um, and the opportunities that come from that, obviously, interfacing and uh, with, with, with others and, and the, the cohorts across the whole programme at the other institutions as well, provides a real rich experience in terms of um, the sorts of things that you can get involved with and joint programme um, and joint training opportunities. The, the DTP is split up into, into three themes that cover the breadth of, of the Natural Environment Research Council's um, uh, areas. And those three themes are atmosphere and climate, um, earth processes, and, and the living, living world. And, and, and what we're trying to do here through the, the training program that really lays the groundwork for, for you moving forward, and then the, the projects that you take off um, is really to provide an excellent uh, postgraduate student experience as, as, as part of, of that and, 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 and really um, set, set you up for the future career that you'll, you'll then go on to do, whether that be staying on um, in, in academia or, or moving off into, into other sectors and, and that the training is holistically shaping you as, as, a, as an individual and your skill set. Um, as well. So, so that really kind of uh, hopefully sets a little bit of the, the context. Um, just to say, as we're going through the webinar here, there's an there's a info sheet in the handout. Um, uh, on on GoToWebinar, there's, there's a range of um, things that you can access, um, including the handouts. It'll be in a little sidebar if you need to just move it. If you've only got one screen, you have to move the windows around to, to get that to happen. Um, there's a handout, as I say. There's also a, a questions section um, where, where you can ask us um, uh, any questions. Uh, and we'll, if there's anything that comes up as we're going through um, that I need to deal with right there, I'll get a little alert up from, from uh, a person working in the background for us, supporting us technically here. So I'll try and answer that straight away. If not, we'll hold the questions until the end and then have a Q&A for everybody to, 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 to ask things um, as we go along there. And the final thing before I get the, the panel here with me just to introduce themselves um, is to say that um, we're going to play um, a video um, in a moment. Um, when we do that, again, sometimes the video starts behind um, the, um, the, the, the actual screens and the multiple windows that you've got. So you might need to might just need to change windows to watch that, that video. Um, so, so yeah, uh, welcome um, once again uh, from myself. Um, I'm going to now introduce the, uh, the the students we have on the program here are here to 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 answer any questions you've got at the end in the main. But um, if I just get them to introduce themselves and um, in no order, the order there on my screen is is Amber's first. So, so Amber, would you like to say uh, who you are, what you do, where you come from? Yeah, um, so I'm Amber, and I just started my PhD in September, so I'm a first year student. And my research is on the evolution of functional disparity in the avian skull. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, and Fiona? 
Hi, um, I'm Fiona. I'm a second year PhD student. Um, my background is in marine ecology, and um, my project is, in my project, I'm trying to understand the population dynamics of um, coral reefs in subtropical seas. Thank you. And then finally, uh, Rick. Hi there, guys. Good evening, all. Um, so my name is Rick. Uh, I am in the same cohort as Amber, so a first year PhD student, uh, and I'm looking at how plastic weathers in the marine environment, how it degrades over time. Thanks very much. And just to point out that Rick isn't in the lab. Um, that that is a cool fish tank uh, in in his in his house. Uh, so we we, we uh, you, you're not you're not still in the lab at uh, past six o'clock at night here. Yeah, but uh, so so. Um, Excellent. So, so what we're going to do now is, is just um, uh, show you a, a video. I've, I've always wanted to say this. So, um, so run VT, please. The NERC Panorama DTP offers postgraduate students the ability to make connections with other universities much more easily than it would normally be. I personally really like working at the University of Hull because it's a very positive environment. And I especially like that people really think in opportunities and are always enthusiastic to listen to my ideas. At Hull, we have a whole host of experience from both academic and industry partners, as well as access to high resolution survey grade equipment, such as drones, the terrestrial laser scanner, as well as the total environment simulator. The candidates from all three universities meet regularly over virtual platforms to discuss progress or just to be social. Being within the Energy and Environment Institute has also been really great. Uh, being constantly surrounded by so many postgraduate researchers and lecturers with such a broad knowledge base and a wide variety of fields. I look forward to completing my PhD and to having a career within the research industry and helping towards a more sustainable future. Through the DTP at Hull, I have taken advantage of the partnership between Leeds, York and Hull Universities by incorporating academic supervisors from multiple universities to guide me through my PhD. I have two supervisors from Hull and one from Leeds. This not only allows me to benefit from the support of one university, but two. This opens the possibilities to grow my academic reach and build my peer group as I undertake my PhD. When I first came to view the campus, I fell in love with it, the whole vibe of it. I really enjoy being a researcher because I get to work on the topics that interest me the most and um, challenge myself in developing new skills and overcoming new challenges nearly every day. I really enjoy Hull and I don't think I'll ever move back down south. Here in Hull there's a lot of research on natural systems and challenges such as climate change and flood risk and I'm excited to contribute to these studies with my more fundamental approach. Being placed at the Energy and Environment Institute gives me a chance to work with world-renowned experts in sediment transport, flooding, uh, microplastics, wind energy. Also giving a chance to work in a very international and multicultural environment. Just think about all those international dinner parties. Being placed in Hull also gives uh, a great chance to explore the nature around. I myself really love hiking and there are some wonderful hiking paths around. The marine setting gives a sort of tranquility, but there is a quite extensive nightlife in Hull as well. So I think it would suit all the tastes. Excellent. So, so uh, th th thanks for that um, and uh, getting that going. Now, now what we're going to do is um, go through all, all of the projects, um, and, and what you'll see is a is a stream of 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 uh, of, of the lead um, advisors coming on and giving giving the background and an introduction to to each of their projects with with a little flash presentation, and then um, you'll come back to myself um, at the end of that. So each one will come up in turn. Um, you come back to, at the end of that where we'll we'll all come together and have have the the, the question and answer session at the end. So um, first first of all, uh, Gerald will introduce his project and then pass on to the to the next the next advisor that down the down the track. So so Gerald, uh, over over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so my project uh, is called um, Systems Thinking for Land Use Policy Making. And this is the supervisory team. So uh, there's myself, uh, who'll be the first supervisor. Uh, Dr. Amanda Gregory will be the second supervisor. We're both co-directors of the Center for System Studies, which basically develops systems approaches to improve policymaking, to help policymakers work better across 
multiple government agendas to deal with really complex problems and to deal with um, really difficult stakeholder conflicts. Um, the co-supervisor with us will be Dan McGonagall, who is head of the systems research program in DEFRA. And DEFRA um, is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. So it's a national government ministry. And the idea is that the student will be placed in DEFRA to do their research there. Uh, next slide, please. So what DEFRA want? Uh, is to develop a new systems approach to help make their policy making more systemic. Um, they want to be able to take account of um, multiple interactions with other policy areas, so how land use um, interfaces with lots of other government agendas, to take account of um, multiple stakeholders outside government, and also to really innovate in the way they include science in their policy making. Um, so what we actually need um, is a student who understands a range of different systems approaches so they can draw upon those to, to help develop something uh, for DEFRA. So I'm less interested in the discipline that somebody comes in with. It doesn't really matter what master's or undergraduate degree you've done. Um, I'm more interested in your knowledge that you have about different systems approaches and your ability to work across theory and methodology and practice to be able to integrate those things. Um, your creativity as well in tackling challenges and developing solutions and your openness to collaboration uh, with a UK national government department, somebody who's really open, engaging, participative, willing to work in partnership. And finally, somebody who's really uh, excellent at written communication so you can write to publication standard. Um, so if you can offer some or all of those things, then we'd really encourage an application. Um, and um, I look forward to uh, answering any questions at the end of this session, and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alastair Ward. Uh, I work in the Department of Biological uh, and Marine Sciences. And I want to pose you a challenge. So. If you're interested in studying the ecology and behaviour of one of this country's most iconic species, and if you have the tenacity to engage in highly physical fieldwork in all weathers, at all times of year, during the day and during the night, in one of the country's most beautiful landscapes, and if you have the adaptability to incorporate ecology with social science and psychology, and if you have the integrity to remain impartial while discussing contentious issues with a range of stakeholders with differing viewpoints, and if you have the enthusiasm for learning to solve complicated problems using a wide range of skills, and if you wish to be a part of a truly interdisciplinary team of wildlife researchers, and if you want to become one of the next generation's interdisciplinary problem-solving wildlife scientists with the potential to influence the way that people value and interact with wild animals, then I really want to speak with you. So in this project, we'll be working with the National Trust, with Forestry England, with United Utilities and the British Deer Society to understand the behaviour and ecology of red deer in the English Lake District and the various attitudes towards them held by stakeholders. Uh, under the supervision of social scientist Dr Charlotte Hopkins, renowned deer biologist Professor Rory Putman and me, uh, you'll work to identify potential conflicts between stakeholders and seek to resolve them using innovative interdisciplinary elicitation and behaviour change methods. While that describes the overarching aim of the project, we want you to drive its direction. You'll be encouraged and supported to develop the broad skills base required to deliver the project and we'll have a healthy equipment budget to invest in technology so that you can collect the data that you need to answer your research questions and it'll be up to you in consultation with your supervisors to decide how to invest your budget. It is an ambitious project that will demand commitment and hard work both physically and mentally and its rewards for the Lake District Red Deer stakeholders, the future of the Red Deer population itself and your future career will be many. So if that sounds of interest, please do get in touch with me.
Hello everybody, um, I'm James Gilbert, um, I am at the University of Hull, I'm interested in insect behavioural and nutritional ecology, uh, particularly parental care behaviour. Um, our project, if you could uh, move on to the next slide, um, is um, called Nutrigenomics and the Resilience of Bees in a Changing Climate and it's co-supervised by Elizabeth Duncan at Leeds who's interested in insect developmental biology and genomics. It's also co-supervised by Laurie Lawson Handley who's someone you'll meet later in this webinar because she's also presenting one of the other projects. So it is a cross-institution project. Um, so two of the biggest threats to biodiversity are climate change and human altered landscapes but it's really rare to get a chance to study both of these effects acting together. And that is what this project aims to do. And we are gonna be using solitary bees as our study system. So we all know that bees are super important for our food security because they pollinate our crops, but they're dependent on pollen from the landscape for their nutrition. And like many animals, many bee species are under threat from factors like climate change and changes to, to the nutrition available in the landscape. Um, but we know surprisingly little about bee nutrition because most studies look at social species, which are in fact only a tiny minority of bee species. But in those social species, it's really difficult to study the larvae in isolation from the colony. So we know loads and loads about adult nutrition, but very little about the larval nutrition. And that's why we study solitary bees because that they have a, a, a simple manipulable system where we can study the nutrition of individual larvae. In my lab, we use a powerful technique called nutritional geometry, which can experimentally identify the optimal diet for a growing animal. And then you can effectively ask the animal which diet it prefers. And we've shown that the larvae of these mason bees that you can see here on the left grow largest when they eat the most carbs. You can see up the y-axis there. What we now want to know is how those effects play out in a warmer future. And Liz's lab at Leeds has identified genes that are up and down regulated in response to different nutrition, specifically those related to development of caste. And what we want to do is to identify those genes expressed in response to different combinations of diets and temperatures to get an idea of how a warming climate will affect the way bees nutri use nutrition. So what you'll do, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, what you'll do is to put out bee cocoons at hull, which will emerge and breed in our experimental nests. And those nests are set up so that you can extract the larvae and transfer them to individual nests with an artificial diet that we, we've formulated. You'll then put those into culture chambers set to different temperatures and monitor the amounts that they eat and excrete. And at the end, you'll assess their body chemistry to determine nutrient storage. And then working with Liz, you'll use high throughput sequencing to establish genome-wide expression profiles in response to these different treatments to establish the effect upon the bee's physiology. And this is gonna be some of the most in-depth work on bee nutritional ecology to date. I find it really, really exciting. It's gonna open up a huge number of questions across loads of different fields, all the way from agriculture and conservation to social biology and ecology. So if that sounds interesting and exciting to you, then please, please do get in touch because we'd love to hear from you. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Rebecca Williams and I'm in the Department of Geography, Geology and the Environment. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about my project on assessing the rock record of hazardous pyroclastic density currents. So interpreting the rock record at volcanoes is the primary way in which volcanologists assess the hazards that the volcano poses to local communities. However, the big problem is, is the rock record of pyroclastic density currents is incomplete. So when we go into the field, we're only ever looking at tiny portions of the evidence of the eruption that happens that formed those deposits. And what we do is a bit like forensic science, we try and piece all those details together. And some recent research has, that's been done has shown that some of the bits of evidence that we've been using to um, identify discrete pyroclastic density currents in the field may actually have only been formed from one pyroclastic density current, but during an eruption that was waxing and waning. So it was, it was getting bigger and then getting smaller and getting bigger and getting smaller. And so what we've realized is that some of the evidence that we've been using in the field to try and reconstruct volcanic eruptions particularly around the emplacement of ignimbrites and pyroclastic density currents, might not be um, what we thought it was. 
So this project is really going to try and tackle that particular question. So we'll have field work where the intention is to investigate the evidence for single versus multiple pyroclastic density currents during major eruptions. We've identified Tenerife as a case study field site and locations in Italy. Tenerife is superb because on the, the band is still there, they've got incredible exposures of ignorant brights. So collecting this kind of data um, is a particularly good place to do that. But alongside the field work, what we want to do is start trying to tie in process, which is the pyroclastic density current, to the product, which is the ignorant brain. And that's the current big gap in our understanding. So you'll also develop an experimental flume um, to model how eruption fluctuations might control pyroclastic density current dynamics and how then that is recorded in the artificial deposits that we create in the lab. And then so you'd be able to compare those artificial deposits and our understanding from the lab experiments to what we see in the field and hopefully we can make some major advances in the way that we interpret um, ignorant brights in the rock record. So we'll be looking at students who either enjoy field work or enjoy um, analog modeling. We don't expect particular expertise in either of those because part of your training with this, this project is to develop um, that expertise with us and we'd give you the individual training to do that. So the supervisory team, we can have the next slide. Um, is me, I'm the lead. Um, my research really is around pyroclastic density currents and how we interpret those to better inform hazard assessments. Natasha Dowie, whose research is um, her PhD research threw up this new question. She's a geologist with expertise in volcanology, particularly around the analysis of uncertainty in modelling. And we've collaborated with Pete Rowley, he's at the University of West England, and he has particular expertise in developing analog uh, experiments. So there's only two flumes in the world that can do the experiments that we want to do using aerated currents. Pete's built both of them, and one of them is currently with him at the University of West England. So that's where we'll be doing the experimental work. You'll be joining the Catastrophic Flows Research Cluster. Um, so you'll be joining a, a small community of people who are already trying to answer questions that are related to this kind of research. Okay. All right, hello everyone. Uh, the video that was shown at the top uh, did mention uh, an international community, so I'm happy to say that I'm part of that. I'm, I'm from Costa Rica and have been here at the University of Hull for just over two years now. I'm currently a research fellow at the Energy Environment Institute, and I'm, I'm interested in, in the processes that shape the landscape, particularly channelized flows. So basically rivers uh, and how they how they form channels, how they evolve in time and shape uh, so if, if we go to the next slide even though i'm from costa rica i developed a, a, a an interest in in rivers that flow over ice um, there's no such thing in costa rica uh, but uh, it's it's something that that we can do in the lab uh, so this this project um, is 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 going to be looking at how these channels form how they evolve uh, mostly from from a lab oriented uh, framework, but we're also uh, going to be doing some remote sensing. Um, the the project will focus on identifying the different tipping points, so different slopes, channel widths, channel depths, temperature differences between the water and the boundary, the ice, um, that basically lead to having either straight channels or braided patterns or meandering. Uh, patterns. Um, these channels don't don't only exist on Earth. Um, just just as I guess as a as a curious fact, uh, there are channels of of molten methane uh, flowing over Titan, one of Saturn's moons. Uh, so this research has not only applications for terrestrial environments but also for extraterrestrial environments. And it'd be it'd be great if we can link to that as well within this project in terms of, of remote sensing, obviously. So if we can jump to the next slide. This, this is the group that's that's gonna be working along the PhD candidate for this project. It's uh, Dr. Robert Durrell. He's also a research fellow here at the Institute. He's got a background in, in mathematics. Uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Jonathan Karavik from the University of Leeds. He's a glaciologist, so lots of expertise in the field 
looking at, at glaciers um, and lakes, proglacial lakes. And myself, uh, background in, in civil engineering, uh, but trained over the last few years uh, as a fluvial geomorphologist. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll let the next presenter go on. Thanks. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, yes, I'm Simon. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so this is the Humber Estuary. It's a large estuary on the east coast of England. Of course, if you come to this webinar, you probably know that already. And as you can sort of see on Google Earth, it's very wide, flat and shallow with a lot of mobile sediment. Large parts of it dry out at low water and the rest of it is mostly less than 10 metres deep, except in the dredged shipping channels. And it has a very large tidal range and that makes the surroundings very vulnerable to tidal flooding uh, with storm surge events or in the future with sea level rise. And the current flood defences for the city of Hull and other, other areas around the estuary are unlikely to last beyond about 2100. So the Environment Agency, which is the agency in England that's responsible for flood protection, is looking at future options. Um, now, the aim of what we'd like you to do is to develop a regional scale numerical model of the Humber, including sediment. Uh, doing that with sediment is slightly tricky, but we have a lot of expertise on that within the EEI. If you could just press forward once, please, Amy. This is the last time anyone did a 3D model back in 1997. So we're aiming for substantially higher resolution than this, although people have done much better 2D models since. But the modeling itself is not the aim of the exercise. The model is a tool. Uh, it's a means, not an end. There are two things we actually want to investigate with it once it's built. Um, one of them is to be able to test out and predict the outcomes of various water and flood management approaches that the Environment Agency is proposing uh, to help inform them and help them to make decisions. And the second thing is to look at how the sediment in the Humber might behave in the future with sea level rise to be able to best predict what changes we might expect to intertidal habitats in the estuary. Um, this project is a partnership with the Environment Agency um, so the student will be based um, in Hull, but you'll also spend some of your time working in the EA's, EA's offices as well. Um, if Amy would move us on, please, we can look at the supervisors. Uh, there are four of us. I'm not going to talk through everything on here. You can read for yourself. Three of us are from Hull and John Hill is from York. But the thing to note is that we're all coming to this from slightly different directions with different skills to contribute. Um, so hopefully uh, we can together provide everything that's necessary to support you. Um, in terms of what we're looking for, um, you could be coming from a rivers or water management or civil engineering background, or you could be a physical oceanographer, or you could be coming from computer science or applied maths or probably other routes. There are all sorts of potential ways into this. Um, the important thing um, when you're putting together an application is uh, yes, tell us why you're capable of this project and tell us why you're a great person for this project. That's obviously important. But also tell us why you want to do this project in particular. Um, give us really strong evidence for an interest in and an enthusiasm for this topic. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing lots of fantastically qualified applicants. Hello everybody, good evening. Mine's, my name is uh, Laurie Handley and I'm a senior lecturer in ecology at the um, Department of Biological and Marine Sciences. So I'm going to tell you tonight about my project that we're advertising which is um, titled Uncovering the Hidden Biodiversity Benefits of Beavers Using Environmental DNA. So this is a project that's um, come about um, from a partnership with the Forestry Commission and um, they're going to be case partners on this project. And the main um, question is to try and understand the impacts of beaver reintroduction on biodiversity. So many of you may know that beavers are native to the UK, um, but they were driven to extinction in the 16th century. And they're really well known as ecosystem engineers, um, and they have been uh, reintroduced into, a couple, well, into quite a few trial sites in the UK um, because of their positive influence on um, fluvial systems, and also for their impacts on biodiversity. But actually, in terms of biodiversity, we only know about the impacts of beavers on a small number of species. So what we want to do in this project is to look at their wider impacts on biodiversity. So looking at everything from microbes through to mayofauna to, um, to vertebrates. And we want to try and understand how beavers um, 
impact the, the actual linkages within those communities as well. So in other words, how they affect the ecological networks. That's something that's never been attempted before. And um, the most efficient way we think to do that is to gather data using environmental DNA. And this is an approach that's really revolutionizing biodiversity monitoring. And our group at the University of Hull have been really pioneering this technology. So it's something that I can say we're really quite good at. So what we do in this um, technique is we take samples such as water or soil, and then we use high throughput sequencing, um, a technique called, called metabarcoding, to describe whole communities from those environmental samples. So we're going to use this method on reintroduction sites in uh, crops and forest in North Yorkshire, as well as Cumbria and Scotland. So that will give us different sites with different habitat characteristics and time since re reintroduction um, to allow us to evaluate impacts at different temporal and habitat scales. So um, if you could just go to the next slide, please, Amy. So this is um, a really collaborative project, and I think a really great opportunity for, um, for a PhD student to do lots of networking and feel part of, um, of, of a really um, big initiative. So at the University of Hull, um, you'll have myself and Bernd Henfling as supervisors. We have a really nice partnership with um, Forestry England, and our partners within the DTP are the University of Leeds, so Mark Smith and Megan Clark there, are um, experts in high resolution topographical surveying. Um, not at all uh, my expertise, but they will be able to, to help produce those um, surveys that will then link to um, the biodiversity information. And we have um, collaborators at the University of Stirling who have been working on the Scottish beaver trials um, for the last 20 years and really know a lot about beaver ecology. And also collaborators at the universities of Salford and um, um, uh, Liverpool John Moores universities who are, um, are also interested in environmental DNA um, and of course the Cumbrian and beaver, uh, the Cumbrian and Scottish beaver groups as well. So this is a great opportunity to do some multidisciplinary science um, with some, some really cool partners, a nice supervisory team and in terms of what we need in this project, so uh, we're not really expecting many people, if anyone, to have prior experience in environmental DNA. Um, so that kind of training we'll, we're prepared to, um, to provide. Uh, if you have a background in ecology, that will really stand you well. And you, you need to be um, equally happy, I think, uh, out in the field or in the lab and doing data analysis. So if you like, playing with data than this project's for you. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Pamme and I'm based um, in the Department of Chemistry. I'm a professor in analytical chemistry there. So um, our project is about a chemical census for environmental citizen science. So we are really trying to um, address a challenge that we have with the runoff we have of, of chemicals and compounds that come from industry, agriculture um, and urban settings and that end up in our waterways. And we know relatively little about the dynamics, how these, these uh, values go up and down, because the, the sensing methods that we have available are really quite limited. So what tends to happen is that an expert goes and takes a water sample and brings it back to a laboratory and then with a relatively uh, expensive arsenal of instrumentation we try to analyze all the different compounds that are in the water. So to really get a bit more of an understanding of um, how seasons and how human activities influence um, uh, the, the sort of dynamics of, of pollutants and compounds we have in the water, we're trying to take a different approach here. Um, and uh, so we call it environmental citizen science. So the idea is to develop workflows that are simple enough so that members of the general public can be trained to do them. So they go out with some very simple equipment, they take the measurement and um, the best way for us to get the data from them is if they take, for example, a photograph of, of their measurement and then upload it through an app. And we have already working a little bit with this on uh, some current projects, as you see in the sort of bottom right there. We've developed um, some, we call them paper analytical devices, so paper-based sensing devices, 
where we embed some, some chemicals and reagents that in this case change color when a certain analyte is present. So you see how the PET is embedded or, or, or put onto a water sample, the water enters, and we get in this case a, a blue color that we can then photograph with an app. And we are using this kind of technique at the moment um, with volunteers that we are training through the, for example, the local Canal and Rivers Trust, but also in uh, Belgium and Germany. So as part of this uh, panorama project, we really want to extend this technology a little bit and want to go uh, to, to um, pollutants that are occurring at much lower concentrations. So for example, for example, pharmaceuticals that might end up in our river waters. And for that, we have to develop some pre-concentration or filtration system. And uh, we're going to be basing them on something that looks a little bit like a cafetier, um, a, a French press that you can see in the middle there. So we'll design a, um, a, a kind of a filter material and that we will push down through the water and the filter material is designed such, functionalized such that it will trap our analytes of interest and then we can do a read out of that. If you can go to the next slide please Amy. Um, so to do this we will bring together four supervisors from the University of Hull and Leeds. So there's myself as a um, the professor for analytical chemistry, as I said, and then also my colleague uh, Mark Lodge will be involved and uh, he also has a chemistry or biochemistry background, but um, these last few years he's um, been very active in science communication and he will give us good steer on how to interact with the members of the general public so that we can convince them to do the measurements for us and also that our workflows are easy enough uh, to be used. And then we have two environmental scientists, uh, Will Mays uh, from the University of Hull and also Paul Kay from the University of Leeds. So hopefully as, as a team uh, we, can, we can guide you through the different aspects that uh, this project would involve. So to do the project similar to some of the other projects, I don't particularly mind exactly what type of degree people have taken, but they need to have at least some background in chemistry so that we can train them how to um, modify the surfaces of these membranes and how to um, deposit the various reagents into our paper analytical devices. So whether that's part of A-levels or part of a, a smaller part of the degree, um, that is sort of less relevant for us. Um, the key really is that there is a willingness to, I put, try and play and fiddle and tinker. So this is not a project where you put a sample into the machine, push a button and then uh, the result comes out. So you really have to play with things and try and optimize to get these simple workflows to learn. And then obviously the, um, the willingness to, to embrace the, the different disciplines as part of the project. So any questions, please get in touch and I hand over to the next speaker. All right, thank you. So my name is uh, Jean-Sébastien Bouillard. I'm a, a senior lecturer in the Department of Physics and Mathematics at the university. Um, and essentially the project that we have today is um, using our expertise in nanophotonics towards improving a product that will uh, help uh, towards a carbon neutral food production. So we know our population is, is ever growing and uh, we need to feed all those people. And so food production and distribution is actually responsible for a, a large amount of our uh, greenhouse gases emissions as well as uh, serious amounts of wastes and plastics in packaging and others. So um, here uh, we're going to use our, our expertise in nanophotonics I was saying to try and address this uh, with our um, partner uh, who develops a certain product. So if we could go to the next slide please. So our partner uh, developed this, um, they, 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 they make those cabinets in Latvia, that where you can grow your own food either at home or at the distributor, local distributor points or in your business. Um, and uh, the idea is to, to, um, to get rid of all the distribution aspect um, and uh, all the, the, the wastage and, and packaging linked to that. Um, the problem is in order to grow plants this way, the light that emanates from uh, the light that they need to use, they're pink to the human eye, and that simply is due to the uh, combination of the absorption spectra of the molecular chlorophyll that is used in photosynthesis. 
So you can see here that it's got this pinkish um, hue. Now, in order to maximize the impact of this approach, what we need is a maximum number of people to adopt that um, that 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 way of of uh, of of growing food and, and providing food for themselves or their local um, businesses, and therefore we need to make the product more more appealing to uh, a large por a larger portion of, of consumers. So some people like the pink color, some people do not like it, and therefore we're going to try and address this using uh, special nanophotonic structures that you can put on the glass. So if we can, go to, if we can actually ad address this, then we can reduce the energy uh, the, the cost and energy consumption. Of, um, of of feeding a large uh, portion of the population, you can reduce the food waste and you can improve nutrition as well and uh, have measurable health benefits because you've got a fresher food um, on top of all that. If we could go to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> as I was saying, we'll use our expertise uh, in, in uh, nanophotonics to um, customize, if you want, the uh, light output. So we can do a range of things. Uh, we can make nice colorful iridescent uh, images. Uh, we can have special eye light effects. We can have holograms so that we're going to have a look at all those techniques to, um, to, to customize this, this light that is necessary for the plant growth, but make it appealing to um, the, 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 the customer slash the consumer so that we can have uh, this method more uh, distributed and, and have a better impact on on, uh, on 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 the environment um, we'll be exploring uh, as you can see in the bottom right corner a method to mass produce those those nanostructures which is called nanoimpedanceography which is the setup on the right hand side but which you can um, think of as as a as a, a, a waffle maker that makes structures on the nano size hence the waffle maker on the side also I like waffles uh, so we'll be looking at this, and that can be easily uh, transferred to mass production. Now, if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, the supervisors in this are uh, myself and Dr. Ali Adawi, um, and so we're we're uh, looking at the nanophotonics aspect in, in in the university, and you'll be joining a, a vibrant team uh, around obviously that expertise. Um, and in general, we try to apply our our um, our knowledge to unlock the necessary novel technologies towards uh, all those um, thriving innovative society goals. <clears throat> we have all the necessary uh, equipment to do this, whether it's experimental or simulation. And here you can see a couple of uh, ex PhDs now, uh, either in the lab or uh, doing some outreach. So the bottom right is one of my ex PhD who is showing the luminescence of quinine in a gin and tonic and um, with the added gin you basically have more lights because you've got a higher quantum yield so if that interests if that product interests you uh, please do let me know and i'll be very happy to discuss hello i'm pete watson and i'm from the department of engineering um, so ecology factors have been known to cause changes to animal behavior and health. And computational biomechanics is often used to investigate the link between form and function of musculoskeletal systems. So there is the potential to expand the use of computational biomechanics to investigate how environmental factors may affect animal health and development. For example, through alterations to diet. So this project aims to demonstrate this potential by investigating the effect of domestication in rabbits upon their oral health. And this is a particular problem in rabbits because due to domestication, there is an alteration to a soft food diet and a lack of vitamin D. And that has been um, hypothesized to cause um, dental diseases. So this project will use engineering uh, techniques, uh, most particularly finite element analysis, to simulate the effect of a change in diet on the tooth uh, movement and bone loss within the rabbit. So this will be able to um, identify the possible cause of the dental disease. And in addition, it will also be able to um, make recommendations as to the future care of domesticated rabbits. So if we move on to the supervisors, 
Um, I, myself, I will be the primary supervisor and I have experience uh, in computational modeling. Uh, I've done that of um, numerous um, anatomical features. So on the screen there on the right hand side, you can see an example of a multi-dynamic skull of a rabbit skull and uh, a finite elements model. So we can actually predict the forces on the skull during biting and then we can use finite elements analysis to actually work out what's happening in, in the bone due to those forces. This project will also be supervised by um, Dr. Graham Askew from uh, the University of Leeds and he has a wealth of knowledge in uh, physiology and biomechanics of animal movements. And together we are also working with the University of Liverpool on a, a larger project where we're trying to build validated um, biomechanical models of the rabbit during chewing and we're aiming to uh, validate these to demonstrate their, their use in biomedical research and with the ultimate aim so that they can be used and reduce the uh, number of rabbits used in experimentations. So this project will work very closely with that uh, research team. So if you do have uh, an engineering background and knowledge of fine elements analysis and are interested in this project, feel free to uh, drop me an email. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Kat Valero and I work in the Department of Biological and Marine Sciences. Can I have the next slide, please? Amy, thank you. So um, our project is about new genomic markers for predicting lizard responses to climate change. Now we all know that the climate is changing, so it's getting warmer and extreme weather events are becoming more common. But the question is how are organisms able to respond to that change? And there are different ways they can do that. So they can shift their distribution areas or they can um, hibernate longer or shift their breeding seasons. But the only one thing that can happen that will ensure long-term survival under hotter climates is um, change at the genome level through mutations and selections. And a lot of groups are studying at the moment how this can take place um, by comparing present populations in different environments and looking at how their genes are expressed in certain situations. Other groups are doing lab experiments where they're using lab populations and observe them over a few generations to see the changes there. But the problem with those methods is that first of all, the, um, the, the comparison of gene expression can't exactly tell you the mechanism of what happened in the past and the comparison of lab populations has other issues such as the fact that they're obviously the organisms are in a lab and you can't do that with all different species. So um, what needs to be done is we need to basically um, look into the past and compare, um, look at how genomes have changed over the past of years that already showed different, um, different um, climates. So if you look at the slide, you see um, our study species, that's the common lizard, so Toka vivipara, and it has um, a polymorphic phenotype as well. So some are orange, some are yellow, and some are white. And um, one of the collaborators has actually studied this lizard species for over 30 years and looked at how the frequencies of these different colors change over time. And luckily, as he was doing that, he was uh, also collecting tissues. So we have the great um, opportunity here to look at the genomes of a population of these lizards over the time span of 20 to 30 years. And the study area is shown in the middle. So you can see the temperature has changed um, quite a lot from 1991 to 2010. And also the precipitation has changed quite a lot. And there were also a few heat waves. So the area that we're looking at is the Pyrenees in Southern France. And um, the little plot with the scatter dots on it shows that um, these exact populations of the common lizard are the ones that are also um, have undergone recent extinction events. So some of those populations have undergone severe declines. There are still some survivors, but they're not doing very well. So what we want to do in this project is we want to look at a certain, um, a certain number of specific genes and basically track how they've changed over time to see why the ones that are persisting today are still persisting and if they're different from the ones that have perished. So are there genotypes that have survived and are there genotypes that have perished? And um, it's, it's not really just a fishing expedition, so we have some idea what we're looking for. 
um, the set of genes that we're looking for is shown in this um, little hairball of dots and lines. So every dot is a gene and every dot with a certain color is a gene that has changed in um, one versus many species or is also responding to physiological stressors. So the idea of this project is that um, the student that we are um, getting on it will go and do something we call targeted resequencing. So the genome of the common lizard has just been published last month. And now we can actually go and pick different parts of the genome that we find interesting and sequence them all in one go with next generation sequencing. And then also um, look at some other elements. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, the team consists of myself. So my group works on adaptation to environmental changes. Um, and stress response. So um, a lot of our students are working on different organisms, but studying similar parameters, which is future climate conditions. And Pedro is also from the University of Hull and his lab um, is more biomedically focused, but he studies um, um, modification of proteins. So we're going to look at different sequences of the genome, but we're also going to be able to look at different modifications of protein over this 30 year period in the samples that we already have. And the interesting thing is that that's really not been done before. So that would be a new technique that you can help develop. Um, a collaborator from Canada, Ken Story, is also um, looking at molecular changes at the protein level. So we're trying to um, basically connect the genome part and the protein part um, as these populations are adapting together. And then um, Barry Snervo from California is an expert in mathematics and evolutionary theory, and he's been studying these populations with respect to their throat color, and he wants to have um, some hypotheses tested that are basically um, saying that different throat color morphs also should be um, having different success adapting to this change in environment. And then Miguel Vences is going to support us because he is experienced with the Southern Pyrenees and the populations of lizards within them. So it, what kind of student are we looking for? We're looking for someone who is not afraid of lab work. So if you have um, had good experiences during your undergrad doing a molecular genetics or molecular lab work, then this would be a project for you. Um, but we're also looking for someone who's not afraid to touch a lizard. Um, because I would like that uh, student to not just analyze the samples that we already have, but also um, travel to the Pyrenees and have a look at the, the current or present of the surviving populations. So yeah, if that interests you and if you want to know more, just contact me. Um, I'm happy to respond. And um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to see your application. Thank you. Well, thanks, th thanks, everybody. And thanks, thanks for all of those introductions. Just before we move into the Q&A, and I invite everybody uh, back um for, for, for that for that session i just wanted to highlight a couple of a couple of things around the the training piece that sits along it you've heard about the projects the really exciting projects i feel i feel like uh, uh may, maybe uh resigning my job and going back and doing some of them actually the, the really inspiring set of projects there um uh, before obviously moving on to those that there's a whole set of um uh, of research training and that's the real benefit of a of a, 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 a DTP is is, is a really kind of trying to fuse all of the training together with with world leading uh, research. So you come out as a as a multi skilled uh, uh, researcher at the end of the program. Now, overall, um, there's a range of, of, of cohort based training activities. So we try to bring the whole group together again. Um, so you benefit from from those those interactions. Um, there's a, a set of specific development themes that we try to um, try to engender through that training program, um, such as personal effectiveness, project management, um, uh, leadership skills, um, how you communicate your research to different audiences and different stakeholders. You receive training on that. Um, how you uh, interface with policy and, and, and the strategies that you may have for, for really taking that research and delivering impact from it as well. And then there's specific training skills around data analysis, analytics, and, and an introduction to things such as machine learning and, and, and things that are working in and around uh, you know, novel ways of analyzing, uh, analyzing data. 
Um, overall, the, the training program is about 40 days across the whole um, uh, term of the PhD. Um, so, so there's a there's a heavy element of training there. But in order to skill you up for really delivering both your PhD and beyond, um, that they're, they're valuable days. And I'm sure you can you can ask some of our existing students around around those. Um, when you start, there's a training needs analysis that's conducted that really then um, it bleeds through into how you target your different your different elements of your 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 own training and your own training journey through the DT. As, as, as well. Um, as well as that, we have um, some major events, including a, a residential um, that, that where, where we try again around the cohort building early on in the program, try to bring everybody together. And then there's also a set of um, uh, cohort based events, such as um, a, a, a conference, an annual conference where, where everybody shares um, the research that they've done uh, and their, their, the, what they've found in their in, in their own journeys as we bring people back together. So, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of the of the flavor of of of, of that and, and how, how we run um, the overall DTP um, itself. And then and then of course you benefit from from all those multilateral connections and and and, and the peer support that comes from being part of, of something more than just just your own your own project. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an introduction to the structure of the of the training that will sit alongside the specific research programs that you can apply for that, that you've just heard about. Um, so so with that, um, we've already got a range of questions coming in. Um, so, so we'll pick up some of those now. But um, as we do that, I'll just uh, I will please invite back the the, the entire. Um, group on the call here, um, including our existing re researchers um, as well. So, hey, Rick, great. Okay, so folks are coming back. So, so you'll see you'll see everybody in the, in 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 the windows now coming through, and we'll go through um, some of the questions that that have come through already. Um, one of the first ones um, that's come in here is is around um, part time um, and being able to study part time. Um, yes. Uh, you can do uh, a PhD by part time, and you can do a PhD by part time at the University of Hull as part of Panorama. So that is open uh, first and foremost. Um, uh, the, the question goes on to ask whether or not there's any disadvantage to doing that. Um, there's no disadvantage from the um, the, the university side. Um, I, I guess. Um, lots of people that do work part time do find the balancing um, of of different parts of their lives um, uh, tricky, um, uh, but other people have really uh, really thrive through that. And it's um, you know we could certainly introduce you to a few of the students and researchers we've got already working uh, part time in their PhDs, and you could you could talk to them about their experiences. Um, it, it, it very much comes down to the individual and how you manage your time um, and how you best do that. But there's there's no there's no specific structural disadvantage um, from from how we how we tier things. I guess there's um, a, a few things around some of the projects that might need blocks of time. So if you're thinking about the loading that you provide on on a part time uh, basis, you might want to to think a little bit and discuss with the potential supervisors around that if there's blocks of lab work. Or, or specific periods of time that you need to to, to be to be around more than 50% across the, the the breadth. It depends on the flexibility, I guess. So that, that that's the only thing I can really think of from from the research side. Um, the only other thing to mention is, yeah, sometimes some of the the events there might be a day long event or or the the residential kind of workshop pieces is over a few days. So so again, there might be periods of time, but they're known well in advance so so hopefully people can plan plan around those but again uh, we're, we're flexible and open to, to to exploring solutions for people in terms of any other responsibilities that they have to balance so 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 please yeah talk to us in more detail about that but overall yeah you can do part time and we'll look to to support everybody in terms of doing that um, i don't know if anybody if you want to wave any of the panel um to add anything in if anyone's got any uh, I, i've i've had a part time PhD student uh, who is a an op uh, ophthalmologist actually um, uh, most of most of his life and um, he did a PhD by part time and um, yeah it's, it seemed to work really well did some field work in Iran actually um, uh, so some geology field work out there so there's a block of time that he was away but it seemed to work work well overall um, so yeah um, that is possible. Um, 
yeah the uh, other questions here um yeah is it possible to do um teaching alongside um the 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 the, the phd research um yeah that that is possible um alistair's on on the call here uh, alistair is as head of head of department would you would you like to or head of one of the departments that, that looks after um a, a range of registered phd um uh, researchers would you like to to take that and talk about some of the opportunities in your area for some of those things yeah absolutely thanks dan um opportunities to teach um the obvious one i think would be demonstrating so we regularly require our, our phd students uh, to engage in lab classes field trips any sort of practical activity um uh, and you will get paid uh, for uh, on, on top of your your stipend for doing that so that's probably the primary route um that we'd uh, uh, in, encourage phd students to engage with teaching on the other um opportunity is um is to offer guest lectures so um both uh, departmental sub, uh, seminars um, faculty level seminars um, uh, but also research group seminars uh, with the possibility of, uh, of contributing those uh, to taught sessions as well so yeah there's a num number of options so if you if you're really interested in in um, higher education teaching then yeah we will accommodate you to meet that passion that, that's brilliant th th thanks Alistair and and Becky um the, the, there's also a training course isn't there uh, I think that the um, is is um, related to um, moving on to to, to um, HEA kind of pathways and things from um, did, did you you probably know a little bit more than me uh, on that I'm kind of looking I know that there's something in there I don't know the full details of it but I know a number of my my students are doing that and, and benefiting from it too yeah the University of Hull offers a, I think it's called the passport to postgraduate teaching and it's a training program specifically designed for um, masters by research and uh, PhD research students to get some training in how to do things like the demonstrating and the lecturing um, and I think through that you can get associate fellowship of the higher education authority and um, which is a, a certificate um, that is nationally recognized that's brilliant I should have pitched that maybe at lorry instead but I was kind of thinking you know who I asked uh, to do that thank you. you you certainly knew more than me on that one so thanks very much um then uh, there's one here um, specifically on uh, nutrigenomics. Um, so James, um, there's, uh, the question is, there's, there's lots of bee species. Um, is studying just one of them, this is like a peer review here, um, is one of them um, uh, uh, sufficient? Um, and, and are you able to extrapolate um, the outcomes from one species to all species? So, so yeah, that's a, oh, that's a great okay. question. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question, um, and uh, I, I would uh, I would dearly like to be able to direct that at the rest of the bee community, who uh, tends to have been studying honeybees and a smattering of bumblebees for most of the history of bee nutrition research. Um, so uh, I would say yeah. So. Um, uh, so what we've got here is really the first chance to look, really the first chance to look rigorously at what happens to individual bee larvae at all. So um, within, a, within a social hive, um, bees come in and they share nutrition with the larvae and you lose track of what's going to individual larvae. And that's a problem for tracing nutrition from the plant to the individual larva. So what we're doing is we're, we, we've got this, this, we've finally got a system where we can um, manipulate nutrition for an individual larva. And that's going to basically open the door to studying the nutrition of growing bees. And that's, you know, bees, all their nutrition as a all their um you know they they assimilate all their nutrition for um growth and development and, and reproduction as larvae and this is a critical point for their nutrition and this is going to be the first time that, that it's been shown um you're right in that it might be that the bees that the, the species that we study specifically are odd and that's actually something that's coming through in our research we've identified um uh, uh, we've identified that they pay most attention to carbohydrates and we think that is because specifically this bee species uh, uh, survives the winter in diapause, it, it overwinters as an adult in, in a kind of a diapause phase in a cocoon um, and we think that they're paying attention to carbohydrate because they have to store fat for the, for the winter. Um, 
and so that's that is you know in terms of what we know about bee nutrition that's new and it's peculiar to this bee species and what it highlights is that um <laughs> uh, what what it highlights is that pe that uh, uh, the nutritional ecology of bees is as diverse as their ecologies which is extremely diverse and so this is like a first tentative step into studying that um and i think it's going to be it's going to be really fascinating the more bees we can do it on the better but this is a start we've also got nesting leaf cutters on campus so if you fancy doing more than one species <laughs> and are brave enough to try it then um <laughs> Uh, that would be a possibility too. Excellent. Thanks, thanks, James. Um, there's an, an additional one here that, that I think is a, a more generic question, but it's asked about the specifics of the skills you need. So, so it's pertaining okay. to the the, the, the eDNA um, uh, project in itself. But I think it is a wider uh, question. In 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 you know how how specific background of skills do do you need um, to come into these sorts of projects? So, so Laurie, would you like to kind of address that, but try try and do it in terms of a more generic kind of uh, response? Because I'm sure it's the sort of question that many people on the call may have yeah absolutely so i think um i think you know the the key skills for being a phd student are being able to throw yourself out of bed in the morning and feel really excited about what you're doing day after day after day when you're going through a roller coaster there will be highs and lows um and you know weathering the storm so there are important transferable skills that go across um, all the different projects and i think it's about your you know your attitude really to you know are you are you really driven um uh self-motivated um those transferable skills are probably more important than you know whether you've done ten thousand pcrs or um you know in in, in your previous life so certainly for um, for me with 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 the project that I, I'm advertising, I'm not too worried if you haven't um, got that much lab experience. So I, I've had two recent PhD students that came from pure ecology backgrounds and have never been in a lab in their lives, um, and they did absolutely brilliantly. And it's you know it's about it's about how you engage and you know whether you can turn your hand to um, to, to different um, different tasks and skills. Um, I think, you know, probably for all the projects, you need to be comfortable with some sort of data analysis. So, you know, if you if you don't like handling data, then maybe, yeah, maybe a PhD isn't really for, for you, because I think probably all of them, you know, uh, involve some sort of data, data handling. Um, and an ability to work collaboratively and, you know, be part of a team. Those are all really, really important skills. So if you haven't got experience in the exact thing that's being asked in the phd then i wouldn't let that put you off contact the supervisor and you know and, and have a one-to-one -one conversation with them um but you know don't don't be put off applying um it's, it's worth giving it a go no, that, that, that's great. Thank, thanks, Laura. I think that's really sound advice. Um, just to mention on, on the call, yeah, I know that um, obviously people have families and and, and things to kind of, uh, uh, but that might might need to that they don't need to drop off the call. Um, I'm happy to stay on and try and field as many questions as I can. If people do need to go on the panel, then please just slip away quietly into the night. And and if there's any specific questions around your project, we will connect people up together. So don't feel the need to to specifically stay on because I know a few people. Um, have have um, have responsibilities that they need to go and deal with. So so that that that's fine. Don't, don't, don't please please uh, don't don't feel the need to to stay on. Everyone's heard your project, and and we can do that later on. Um, the um, next question: um, Are there other other pro Are there any other projects available that aren't mentioned this evening? Um, on the D on the broader DTP, yes, there is, and um, there's projects at York and Leeds as well. So I encourage you to have a look through their projects as well. What we've concentrated on are the projects led by the University of Hull here tonight. Um, but there are other projects there. But we will only be uh, um, advertising the the 13 projects as part of the DTP. Um, uh, that, 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 are, that are available and up and on, is it 11 or 13? I can't quite remember. Um, the ones that you've heard about that are advertised um, are, are the ones that are available this year. Um, we do have other opportunities that come along. Um, we have the Centre for Doctoral Training in Offshore Wind and Environment. There's a range of, of potential projects there. And there are other projects that come through that are funded in other ways. So, so do keep your eyes peeled on, on those. But, but the DTP ones are the ones that you've heard about tonight. 
Um, are the uh, projects assigned to a specific institution or the supervisors from multiple institutions uh, awarded by multiple institutions? Uh, no, you're registered at one university across the partnership. So, so, so your PhD is, is awarded by the institution that where your primary supervisor is, is, is located and you'll primarily be based there. You will benefit from the broader uh, uh, DTP, but um, your degree certificate and where you receive your your, your PhD from will, will be the university you're registered at as part of the program. Um, what's this? Uh, what's this? Uh, what's uh, the candidate requirements for the, um, the computational biomechanics? Um, is, is there a need for anything beyond uh, FEA knowledge? So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly um, on, on those scores. Is, is there anything to, to, to add to that one? Um, have we still got, is Peter still here? Yes, um, it's the requirements for this will just be a, a background in engineering. So if you have a, um, a bachelor's or a master's in mechanical engineering or biomedical engineering, um, you should have, with, with those um, subjects, will have already covered the, the, the kind of mechanics you need for this project and I will presume you will have covered finite elements analysis as well. Um, but if you have got any kind of uh, queries as to whether you uh, have the relevant knowledge, just, just send me an email and we can talk about it. That's great. Th th thank you, Peter. Um, there was one here, Laurie. Will, will most of the work on, on, on your project be conducted at Hull given the range of other, other, um, uh, other partners? Um, <laughs> most of the work uh, posted actually within Hull? Yeah, so um, primarily, yes. So all the molecular work will be done at Hull and Hull is the, the, the base. Um, and actually, um, north the, the Cropton um, reinstruction site is also the main uh, site that you'd be working on in the field. So not too far away from here. Um, the other... Uh, so, I mean, there will be trips to Cumbria and, and, and Scotland to look at the other reintroduction sites there. Um, but I think probably most of the collaboration with um, with Stirling and, and Liverpool and Cumbria universities will be done in, in, in terms of meetings and, um, and maybe some uh, uh, some visits physically to Leeds as well for, um, for, for chatting with um, Mark and Megan. But yes, you will be um, right. have your uh, Hull as your main base. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, there's one here on, on the actual application process and, and selection process, which is a really good one. Um, so, 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 yes, you, you apply to the DTP. Um, there's a range of projects that, that are advertised. Um, and then there's a selection procedure involving an interview and a visit. Um, it, that, that'll probably be virtual, depending on where we are with the pandemic. Um, the sorts of timing um, is, 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 is the, of the interviews is normally around March, April time. Um, I don't think they're set days yet, but they're very close to being finalized. Um, but that's the sort of time scale. Um, you hear about whether you have an interview about six weeks ahead of time. Um, so, 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 so you'll kind of um, hear whether or not you've, you've got an interview. Um, and then um, there's a, a set of panels across the three themes that I introduced that then select and grade the, the students um, or the applicants on, on the basis of, of where they rank on, on interview and application. And then um, as a DTP um, a kind of executive team, we go through and we, we basically uh, assign um, the strongest student um, to 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 the projects that are available. So so it, which project gets selected and which student gets selected is very much down to the quality of the application. Um, so so uh, it, if it's advertised, it's got an equal opportunity of being of being uh, fully funded and having a a student um, uh, assigned to it based on based on that selection process. That's all based on the quality. Of, of the student and every student is graded against a set of criteria um, and, and we, 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 we grade against um, a set of questions that are kind of generically structured um, and then have a, some specifics around the, the project area and then a set of additional generic questions and, and everyone gets graded on, on the performance across that, that criteria set. Um, so, so hopefully that gives you a flavour of how that, that works and how the top candidates are selected um, from that. Um, 
there is a sift process before um, interview. Um, so, so based on based on the applications, we will sift. Um, uh, about twice the number of, of um, applicants that there are places, um, uh, because um, obviously people will, will, will normally apply for a few PhDs, and uh, and sometimes people will choose to go on to other 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 courses um, uh, and, and have multiple opportunities. So 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 we do interview more than there are places um, to, to 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 take up. So that hopefully that that answers that. Um, I've got. Um, it's this one or oh, this one. um uh, it, uh, specifically on the start date um a start date so this will be a september intake um if, if that's the question um how long does it take between getting an application and receiving a rejection letter <laughs> 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 hopefully that wouldn't be the case but um but but normally um you sit, submit your application there's about a six week turnaround in terms of being invited to interview hopefully rather than and being re rejected um there's nothing no, no, nothing like being positive um so that's this uh can I have more information on the application process i've done that um how many projects are funded through the dtp um so normally um there's there's about um with, with the added ones there's about 20 a year on the actual dtp program in total um at the university of hull depending on where the uh, because we grade all of the students across York Hull and, and Leeds in terms of applicants. Normally, we have three or four um, starters at Hull um, uh, each year on, on the, on the programme. Um, so hopefully that helps with that. Can you apply straight from undergrad degree or do you need a master's? Uh, no, you can apply straight from an undergrad degree. There's no barrier to, um, to, to, to that at all. Um, in fact, um, lots of the best practice around this now is is really kind of looking at the disadvantage of 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 um, uh, or people being disadvantaged by having to have a master's and and how um, for for some people that that's beyond their financial capacity to support themselves through a master's. So 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 no, there's no requirement. It's down to your quality and your trajectory, how you can convey how well you will you will do moving moving forward. So. So, so yeah, I think I think that was that one there. Um, so, ah, um, is Simon still here? Or is Simon? Ah, Simon is still here. So, Simon um, is still here. I'm I'm interested in researching the impacts on coastal areas from sea level rise. Would that come into your project? Um, I would say yes, but it's probably not the core focus of it. The short and succinct answer. Okay, well, that's that's really good. Um, I'll, I'll add to that slightly. There is a lot of work that goes on within the Energy and Environment Institute uh, about flood impacts, um, and so if you wanted to take the project in that direction, um, we definitely have the expertise to support that, and I'd encourage you to follow that interest as long as we got the core work done as well. That's great, thank you. Um, I think that brings us to the end of all the questions. Maria, can you? Can you either put just in this chat window for me that there's nothing else coming through? Um, yep, that's it, she said. So so that's brought us to the end. Unless you've got a real burning question that you can type quickly, um, I'm going to go to end the, the, the webinar there. Just to say thank you um, to everybody who's who stayed on the call. So so yeah, we've got 41 attendees, which is fantastic actually. So so thanks for thanks for coming along this evening. Um, thanks to all of the panel for sticking around for the Q and A. Um, very much appreciated. Um, and thanks for all the work that's gone into presenting presenting these these superb projects. So so thanks thanks very much for that. Um, and oh. There's, there is one more just come in just before I was going to say bye. Um, do I need to apply for the PhD project and the funding separately? No. Um, so the, 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 the projects are available with the with the with the DTP. So that if you are if you are accepted onto a place, the funding is connected directly to the project. Now, um, there's opportunities should you not be selected through the DTP to still come and, and study here here at Hull. Um, the funding then becomes the kind of barrier to, to, to being enrolled onto a course. But there are other funding opportunities and other scholarship schemes that, that, that could potentially be connected into, into projects. So, so I would encourage you 
um, to, to, to be, you know, engage with the supervisory team um, about your application. If you're not selected on the DTP, that doesn't mean it's the end of the journey. Um, there's still opportunities from, for other funded sources. That project will still be available if no one else is recruited to it. And I'm sure if, if, you, you know, if you're a suitable applicant and the, the supervisory team are keen to take you on, then, then that they will help you um, look for, for, for alternative funding mechanism. I'm not saying that's easy. Um, uh, that, that you know that that'll be competitive, and uh, and and you know the, there are different ways of combining sources of funding together. But I'm sure that the teams will be really keen to, to help support you, um, bring 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 great people onto onto these projects, um, as many as we can is is my ambition. Um, but but through the DCP, yeah, rest assured the funding is connected. Um, to to the project, and you automatically would receive that if you were brought on to the DTP. Um, so so yeah, I think I think that really is now the end, and I can hear my children starting to uh, starting to play havoc with 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 my wife, and so I better go and help her do that. Um, but that brings us to the end. Thanks once again for everybody for for tuning in, and um, and yeah, hope hope to get lots of applications from from those of you that that tuned in tonight. Thanks a lot, and uh, bye from me.